you'll take your Bibles, please, and open them to the book of Galatians. We're in chapter 4. We're looking at the first seven verses. Galatians chapter 4, the first seven verses. Under the doctrine of the true gospel, which is being dealt with in chapter 3 and 4, we've looked, first of all, in relation to the person of the Holy Spirit. And secondly, we've examined the promise to Abraham. And now third, we're looking at our position in the Lord, our position before God. Galatians chapter 4, there are notes in your bulletin. We invite you to follow along with us as we study God's word together. Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 to 7. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father, even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. You join with me in a moment of prayer. Father, we do thank you again for your word. We thank you for the position we have in Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, that we can, in exploring your word, discover the true gospel of grace. We pray you'll continue to teach us to walk by faith and not by sight. We pray for those in our audience who are not sure of their relationship to Christ. We pray that they will understand that it was in the fullness of time that God sent forth the only answer to the problems of the world, and that is Jesus Christ himself. Help us, Father, to believe that he is the Savior and the Lord of our life. We thank you for this time of fellowship in your word. For Christ's sake we pray. Amen. In verses 1 to 3, as we are examining the word of God in relation to our position before God, the Apostle Paul deals with the bondage that we are all under, and his illustration is affecting the law. And he uses the contrast of a child to a slave. And his basic point here is that a child, before he achieves a time appointed by the father in which he's called a son, he is no better than a slave. So the first thing we want to share with you about that bondage, and they're not, as I looked at the notes, there's not much space there, so find a little paragraph somewhere or a spot somewhere where you can write in some notes. But the first thing is to notice that there isn't any difference between a child and a slave, even though he's a son and he has all the inheritance promised to him. He's exactly the same. According to Roman times, the child, until he had come to the time appointed by the father in which he would be declared a son, the child could not, for instance, sign a statement or a contract. He had no rights, really, except that granted by the father through tutors or governors. Now, what are tutors and governors? Well, their responsibility was very simple. The tutor was like a teacher of an individual child who was trying to train them, just like we have public schools today and teachers who guide the instruction of our ch children. In Roman times, they had them in the homes, men who were responsible for the person of the child. Now, they not only taught the child, but they also were responsible for the care of that child. If that child, for instance, would uh, wander a little ways from home, the tutor was responsible if anything happened to that child. Tutors were always slaves. Now the word governor is our word steward that appears so often in the Bible. A steward or a manager of a household. And that involved the person's property. Now two ideas are here. One is care for the person, a guardian of the person, and teaching that person, disciplining that child. Second is taking care or being a guardian of the property of that child, mainly meaning the inheritance. He can't receive it until the time that is appointed. I'd like you to notice the end of verse 2, that little statement, until the time appointed of the father. 
Now, I wasn't sure when I first came to this passage uh, as to whether or not in Roman times the fathers were required at a certain age level to pronounce their sons or their children legally the heir. But I discovered, according to the Roman records, that the father could designate his own time. An example of which, uh, your child at 13, you might say, he is now my adopted son, he is free to exercise rights accordingly. Or you might decide it isn't until 16 or 18, but it was all the decision of the father. Now that to me is a beautiful thing. Because in the plan of God, it was the father's decision as to when Christ would come into the world and answer the bondage of the law that had kept men under, had tutored them, had been guardians to them, even of the inheritance that they would receive. As we learned in chapter 3, the law was a schoolmaster, a disciplinarian, driving men to Jesus Christ. Well, the Father decided when he wanted that time to be announced to the world. And as it were, the whole world that was under the bondage of the law was now pronounced heirs of God through belief in Jesus Christ. So when God decided, at that moment he designated, Christ came into the world. It was all the Father's plan. You remember when Jesus ascended into heaven, he said to the disciples, when they asked, is this the time to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, his own authority. According to the Bible, the whole plan of God is under the direct supervision of the Heavenly Father. There is, for instance, an interesting statement in our Lord's Olivet Discourse when he said concerning his own com coming that no man knows the day or the hour, not even the Son. And you say, well, doesn't he know all things? Yes, but in some sense, when he subordinated himself in the flesh, he voluntarily laid aside certain rights, one of which was the knowledge of God's plan, and he submitted, therefore, to the will of God, always, and became our great example. And he said to men, listen, the only one who knows the day and the hour is the Heavenly Father. It is God's plan from beginning to end. You know, in Romans 11.36, it clearly teaches that when it says that all things are out of him, that is, by way of source. All things are operating through him, not Christ, but God the Father. And all things will be unto him by way of goal or objective. And I read in 1 Corinthians 15 that even Christ, who will be given a kingdom and all things put under him, will turn that back over to the Father. So the Father's plan is something that's in his mind, and he has the times appointed as to what he wants to do. Now, if you want to put it into vernacular, Jesus Christ came on schedule, in other words. You see, the Father had it all timed perfectly as to what he wanted to do. And that brings us to the matter of the birth of Christ in verse 4 and 5. He says, but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Now, to understand what has gone on in the first three verses with verse 4, I want you to look at verse 3 at the word elements. Elements. We were children, like the children in a Roman home. We were in bondage under the elements of the world. Now, what are the elements? The word translated elements is simply the idea of first principles. First principles. And it deals with the character of the moral and civil laws of God. We were under these until all of time came to a great fulfillment. And one of the greatest teachings about the meaning of Christ coming into the world and what he accomplished in relationship to the law is right here. All the law were first principles which came to their maturity when Christ was born. And in Christ, all that which the Old Testament was saying is fulfilled. Hebrews 1, 1 to 3 says that in these last days, God, who spoke in various times and sundry ways by the prophets, now has spoken how? How? In his Son, Jesus Christ. The complete revelation in Christ. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the 
Father, full of grace and truth. Evidently, Christ, as the revelation, the Word of God, was full of, completely jam-packed with, truth and grace. We were under law. Grace came by Jesus Christ. John 1 says that the law came by Moses. Grace came by Jesus Christ. All truth. We had first principles, now truth totally revealed in Jesus Christ. When the fullness of time came, Christ came into the world. Now keeping that in mind, I want you to look at verse 4 carefully when it says the fullness of time was come. First of all, the word time is the word we get chronology from. Chronological time. There are several words for time in the original language, some meaning seasons or definite periods of time. But the word used here is chronological time. In fact, the word chronological comes from the word chronos, chronological, a succession of moments, and bang, God did something. Now he's saying that all time was building up to something. Don't miss that in the word fullness. All of time, chronologically, from the beginning of the Bible until Christ's coming of the world, was building up to a point of maturity or completion or fullness. It was completed, done, when God sent forth his Son. In other words, the whole direction of human history is centered in the birth of Christ. And isn't it interesting that our dating system all surrounds him? A.D., B.C. When the fullness, the completion, the end of time came, God sent forth his, his Son. Now, time did not end in succession of moments, so it has to deal with maturity of God's plan, that the fulfillment of God's plan is Jesus. Nothing more needs to be added to him. So when the fullness of time came. Now, what does that statement mean? Why does the Bible say that? I'd like to share with you at least four things involving that. So if you can find a little piece of paper somewhere, jot these down. First of all, we're going to look at one of them in detail. First of all, number one, according to the Bible, this was a fulfillment of a specific prophecy. When the fullness of time was come, number one, is the fulfillment of a specific prophecy. And that prophecy is Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. Will you turn there, please? The book of Daniel chapter 9 verses 24 to 27. The Bible says when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son. And basic and primary to that interpretation of the fullness of time is a fulfillment of prophecy. Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. Let's look at it. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. It's interesting to me that out of all the passages of the Old Testament and prophecy, here is one that specifies a plan of God and gives a point of time at which it begins and a determination of that period of time, indicating that God has a plan that's unfolding and it's going to come to a great climax. Seventy weeks are determined. It doesn't mean that it's just going to be a coincidence of history. It means that God planned it totally from beginning to end. Upon thy people, upon thy holy city, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, quite a statement, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks, or 49. The street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks, and in the Hebrew the idea is after the 49, they separate seven from three score and two, after three score and two, that's the second of the statements of verse 25. Seven, then three score and two. So it just picks it up where it left off, and the idea is after the 49. Shall Messiah be cut off 
but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end of it shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. Again, the Bible clearly indicates that all history is being unfolded according to a definite plan. Do you believe that? You know, in reading this, the first thought, uh, I don't know, maybe you don't uh, see things this way, but the first thought that came to my mind is, does that mean the minutes in my day? It really says that. It's determined. Do you believe that history is determined by God? That's quite a statement. The moments of my day are under a tremendous plan of God that's being unfolded. Now, verse 27, he, meaning the prince that will come, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined, shall be poured upon the desolate. You know what, I have to tell you something, old Dr. Bauman in our church used to preach a lot on Daniel 9, and I don't know why, but I still have that in my head. And uh, also, Dr. Mays spoke about it frequently. I still had that in my head. But you know one thing that drove me batty all those years? Is what in the world verse 27 was talking about? All those words, consummation, desolate, determined, you know, poured out, overspreading, abomination. You know, it's hard to keep a track there. What's going on? In this passage of Scripture, we have an answer, the main biblical answer to Galatians 4.4. The statement, when the fullness of times, plural, by the way, in the Greek text in verse 4 of Galatians, four times, all the succession of moments of history to that point, when it had come to a full point, God sent forth his Son. And the, answer, and the question is, well, what in the world is the beginning of this and the ending of that? Now, according to verse 24 and 25, the commandment that went forth was to restore and to build Jerusalem. But in verse 25, at the last phrase, it says the word, the wall. Now, you and I would have been left to conjecture as to how to put this time period together if it had not had the statement, the wall, in it, because there was only one commandment to restore the wall. And that one you'll find in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1. Now, there were many returns to the land under Ezra, as well as Nehemiah, Zerubbabel and Joshua going back to the land after the Babylonian captivity. But only under Nehemiah 2.1, which is interesting because that's the only one that has a specific date, does it tell us about rebuilding the wall. And according to Nehemiah 2.1, it happened in the 20th year of Artaxerxes, king of Persia. Now we know when that man reigned. He began his reign 465 to 464 B.C. So 20 years from that brings us down to 445 or approximately 444. Now, if you think these are details, to me, they're the marvelous unfolding of God's plan. And it's thrilling to realize it. Now, according to the Bible, there are 77s. The word translated weeks here in Daniel 9 could be days, weeks, or years. It's simply the word seven in Greek. Now, according to this, we have the understanding that there are going to be 49, or 69, excuse me, I don't want to confuse you, 69 weeks until two things happen. Verse 26, one, Messiah is cut off. That's the crucifixion. And two, the people of the prince that shall come will destroy the city and the temple. That happened in 70 A.D. It was destroyed. And then following that will be the 70th week in which this prince who will come, who is, we know, as the Antichrist or the man of sin or the world political leader, he will confirm a covenant with the Jews to restore their temple sacrificial system. He'll break that covenant in the middle of the week. And that's what Jesus was referring to in Matthew 24, 15, when he said, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, then you better flee for your lives. This prince who will come is an abomination to God, and he will desolate everything, waste it, destroy it. He's called the abomination of desolation by Jesus. 
And when he stands in the temple area, Jesus said, you better get out of there. Now, according to the Bible, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son. Messiah was cut off after the 69 weeks. And as you see by the little chart there, by the way, a prophetic year is 360 days. You learn about that in Revelation 11. And if you multiply 360 by 483, you have those many days. And if you'll subtract the days between 365 and 360 and all the leap years, you will discover that approximately 29 or 30 A.D. is when Jesus died. Amazing. When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son. God is always on schedule, never misses. Now back to Galatians chapter 4, please. Galatians chapter 4. The first is a fulfillment of Bible prophecy, when the fullness of time was come. Now number two. The entire Mosaic law was accepted in the world. Or you might say the Mosaic law was doing a teaching work in the whole world. The whole world had come to a universal acceptance of the principles of the Mosaic law. This is beautiful to me because not many nations had agreed to that until Rome. Rome built their entire system on the law code of the Bible. Did you know that? Guess where the U.S. built their law code? Same way. Many of the law codes of Rome, the the democracy and the republic that they set up, are still supposedly the constitutional framework of our nation. Amazing. All based on the Mosaic law code. And so imagine the scene. Under the law, Jews under the bondage of Rome, and yet here Rome has accepted, and universally throughout the empire, the Mosaic law is taught and followed. And it's amazing. In that fullness of time, God sent forth his Son. And in the context here, we're dealing about its relationship to the law. And here worldwide, for the first time, you've got acceptance of the Mosaic law. Now third, Greek culture and language established for the first time in human history one world of communication. Greek culture and language, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son. You remember the Tower of Babel when the languages are confused? How many languages of the world are there? We don't know. They just kept spreading and growing. It appeared to be a multiplicity of languages. But finally, first of all, through Alexander the Great, as he conquered the world, literally, for the Greece Empire, he established and forced upon all the peoples he had conquered Greek. Now you hear me refer to to Greek. Uh, What if we commanded you to learn Greek by next Sunday, say? But that's exactly what Alexander did. He refused to communicate with the people in their own language. He refused their language to be spoken. He demanded that Greek be established. Now when the Roman Empire came, controlling the entire world, Everybody is communicating in a common language called Koine Greek, and that's the language the New Testament was written in. Think of it. When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son. Wherever the message would go, everybody would hear it for the first time in their own language. And isn't it interesting that now in human history we had the reverse happen? From the Tower of Babel, it spread out over the world. In one moment of time, God brought it all back together in one Greek language. The whole world could understand the message. And now what's happened since then? The distribution of the Scripture in every language of the world. Many still being without the Scripture, of course. Amazing. When the fullness of time come, God sent forth his Son. Now, fourth, the Roman Empire established a network of roads. Roman roads, and established a worldwide peace. When the fullness of time came, God sent forth his Son, and the missionaries of the gospel of Christ could immediately spread over the entire known world by the Roman road system. When we were in the Holy Land this summer, and in the lands of the Bible, we saw the Roman road at the city of Philippi. Now that's up in what was ancient Macedonia, Greece today, northern Greece, just below Yugoslavia. 
and inquiring with the guide about that Roman road, which, by the way, is just amazing that they built those roads, the kind of condition that they're in, inquiring how long was this particular road, you know what his answer was? 1,000 miles. It goes from the city of Rome clear to the city of Constantinople. One road alone. And people, there are hundreds of them all over the empire. The Romans were the greatest road builders in the history of the world. I think they did a better job than our freeway system. Excuse me. But I really think so. Fantastic. And think of it, for the first time in human history, the gospel had immediate access, immediate ability to transport itself across many, many miles to many, many people when the fullness of time came. But some people leave out the Roman peace. There never was in the history of the world a time like the Pax Romana, the Roman peace, do you realize that the, even though there was persecution against the Christians, that for the first time the citizens of Rome had freedom to preach whatever they wanted to preach, provided, of course, that they submitted to Roman government. And so the gospel went out when a Roman empire had established a worldwide peace. And we sit there and we read our Bible so simple. When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son. This is Thanksgiving, and I want to tell you what my response was, was just, thank you, Lord. It is really something. When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son. And you know, there never was up to that point a, a moment of history like it, and there has never been since. When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son. Now, what was the method? I'd like you to look at the method which God used. According to verse 4 and 5, there were four things, four things that were essentials in this method. One involved God's plan. It is God who sends forth God's plan. According to verse 2, as we had mentioned earlier, there was a time appointed, a time appointed by the Father. God did the sending. Now, the second thing we learn about the method God used is that he chose the Son, the second person of the Trinity, to be the instrument in which the answer would come to the entire world of how to be saved and how to be righteous before God. So we learn that the Son must have existed before he came into the world. What's more is the little word made of a woman is not the word to be born physically, it's the word to become Jesus, is, it's never said he was born physically. He's not a little born one. Jesus was made, or he became, of the woman. You know, John 1.14 says the same thing. The word was made, he became flesh. Not was born by natural birth, but became flesh. We also have in this verse of scripture, the incarnation and virgin birth as God's method of bringing Christ into the world. Made of a woman. God manifest in the flesh, as well as his sinful, uh, sinless life. He never committed any sin. And it says at verse 4, made under the law. Now, what does that mean? It means simply this, that all the world was under the law, unable to fulfill it, unable to do anything about it. They were under bondage to it. But one man, Jesus Christ, came into the world and completely fulfilled the entire Mosaic law system. Unbelievable, but true. Every bit of it, he fulfilled the law. Jesus himself said, I come not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. In Romans 10, 4, it says, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to them that believe. And some people say that what it means there is that he is cutting off the law, destroying it. It's no longer important. That's not what it says. Christ is the completion, the fulfillment, that meaning end, the fulfillment of the law to those who believe. You see, there wasn't one thing in the Mosaic law that Christ didn't fulfill and do. How strong did Jesus believe that about himself? In Matthew 5, he said, not one jot or one tittle shall pass away till what? All be fulfilled. Now, a jot is the smallest letter in the Hebrew language. I want to make one on the board for you, on the chart here. It's not a board screen. Terrific. 
just broke it. That's a jot. That's a jot, just that little comma right there. That's a jot. Not one jot or one tittle. Now, when you're reading along in Hebrew, it's very hard to distinguish between those two letters. Actually, it's this little extension out beyond the other one that is the only difference. And if you don't look closely in all the fancy writing of Hebrew's Bible, you can just go right by it. There's a passage, for instance, in one of the prophets, and every Hebrew word has basically three letters in it. And this letter means to praise. If it was this letter, it means to profane or to curse. Just changes the meaning. One little tittle. Just one little thing. On one of the letters, Jesus said, not one jot, the smallest letter, or one tittle, a marking on those letters, shall pass away till all be fulfilled. And here's what God is saying. He was made under the law. That Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to them that believe. You know, I'm not sure that we have really fathomed what that means to us. That means when you ask Jesus Christ to come into your life, Jesus Christ has already fulfilled every single thing that's in your Bible. And you know, the moment you believe, you have already fulfilled it also because of Jesus Christ. Your life is Jesus in you. He who fulfilled the Old Testament entirely. His righteousness is beautiful. There's nothing missing. Everything is paid for. Everything is done. Everything is fulfilled. And it's yours the moment you believe. Pretty great. In fact, it's fantastic. Now, verse 6 and 7. First of all, verse 5. The purpose, the purpose that's involved, according to verse 5, as to why God in the fullness of time sent forth his Son is very simple. To redeem them that were under the law. Notice Christ made under the law, people are under the law, but they're experiencing condemnation. Christ is fulfilling it, never sinned. The law can't condemn him. Well, he redeemed those that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. Now think with me carefully again about Roman times. The slave in the slave market, to be redeemed, there had to be a purchase price made. Now, when you buy a slave, it means that he's under a new master. That's one word. We shared that with you uh, last week about the different words for redemption. But suppose you wanted to set that slave free. You could do that. By paying the total price, the ransom uh, price of that slave, and pronouncing him or adopting him or placing him in your family as a son and giving him freedom and all of the inheritance. Now, according to the Bible, Christ redeemed us who were under the law, like slaves, that we might receive the adoption of sons. We have now been placed as sons by God. We have been given all the inheritance. Why? Because when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son to redeem us. He's paid the price of our sin and redeemed us out from under the law. The law says the soul that sinneth it must die. Christ came, fulfilled the law. He didn't have to die for his own sin. But he did die. Therefore, he satisfied the righteous demands of the law. Now, those of us who are under the law, and the law says you must die for what you have done, are now set free because Christ paid for what the law demands, death. Now we are free. And now we are able to be declared sons, adopted as such, and have the inheritance. And that blessing of sonship is twofold in verse 6 and 7. Let's look at it. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Abba is an interesting word. I almost, uh, you know, it's hard to tell you the meaning of it without it having a tendency for us to get maybe a little uh, irreverent. But we must tell you what it is in order for us to understand and appreciate what he's saying here about our position in the Lord. The word Abba was an Aramaic word. Aramaic was the language spoken in the land of Palestine at the time of Christ. It's a form of Hebrew. And Aramaic was spoken there, and in a, in a home, when a child would turn to his father and would give him the most familiar term possible in a family, it would be Abba. 
we would translate, and I believe this is proper, daddy. The most familiar term that possibly a child could say to his father was Abba. Now notice what he's saying. You were slaves under the law with no rights of your own, and Christ died for you. But not only that, not only did he set, he free, set you free, he adopted you as a son. He made you in the family of God as though you could say to him, and please understand this, Daddy. Daddy. Not being irreverent, but understanding that our relationship with the eternal God is so close, it's like a child sitting on his father's knee and saying, My Daddy. I think that is fantastic. And do you know why you're able to do that? Because of the presence of the Holy Spirit in us. When the Holy Spirit comes into us, it's as it were we could sit on the Father's knee and say, that's my daddy. Welcome to the family, in other words. We're in the family of God, and he's our heavenly Father. I wonder, do you sense that relationship to him tonight? Do you really? He's my daddy. Is he that close to you? You know, according to this passage, it's the presence of the Holy Spirit that makes that real. And what's more, according to verse 7, we are no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Turn quickly over to Romans 8 and just look at this text. Romans chapter 8. You know that all the people who were under the bondage of the law were always in fear? Who wouldn't be? Look at verse 14 of Romans 8. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of what? Adoption. You've been adopted as a son, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, Daddy. The Spirit himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. That's exactly, you see, what Galatians 4, 7 said. That because of the presence of the Holy Spirit, we know that we are children of God and can have this relationship with the Father. Verse 17, and if children, then heirs. Heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. One more verse. I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us, a part of our inheritance. Everything in life is not worthy to be compared with the inheritance we have. And the moment you come to believe Christ, the Holy Spirit is in you. You are in the family, and he's your heavenly father. You know, often when uh, you're teaching somebody to pray, you say, our heavenly father, or dear heavenly father. You know, I wonder if we shouldn't say, my heavenly father, my father, my dad. You know him that well? Is he that close to you? Let's close with prayer. Father, for those here tonight who perhaps feel it strange, what we have just been talking about, to have this kind of relationship with God, Father, help them to understand that the moment they believe in Christ, the Holy Spirit does come into their hearts and giving them a new realization of their position in the family and of all the kinds of attitudes that we need towards the Father. The wonderful closeness of this relationship, we thank you, Lord has been established because Jesus Christ has paid for our sin and satisfied the righteous demands of the law. We thank you that at a perfect moment of human history, Jesus our Lord was born into the world. We praise you for all that he has done for us. We praise you for your great plan. We pray tonight, Lord, that those here in our midst who have not come to a full persuasion of their faith in Jesus Christ that by your Holy Spirit you might lead them right now to trust him alone as the Lord and Savior. And Father, we pray that you will stir within the hearts of those of us who know you as Christ, in Christ, 
We, you will stir within us the desire to have a close, personal relationship to you. We thank you that you are our Heavenly Father, that you love us as children, that you care for us as children. And God, I would pray that you'd help us to realize that one day we will have an inheritance as sons in the family, like that to Jesus Christ, joint heirs with him. And may all the things that we suffer in this life and all the temporary pressures and problems be looked at in relation to the glory of our inheritance in Jesus Christ. That if we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. That all the things we experience now are but light affliction, which is but for a moment, and works for us a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, the eternal things. And we thank you for this. In the precious name of Christ, our Savior, we pray. Amen.